Now we're in the summer of peace. And in the scripture text that we have for today, it's the primary and the focal point for Christ coming and preaching peace to us. I'd like for you to take your Bible and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to read this passage of scripture that has been assigned to us for today about Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. I would like to invite you to stand with me while we read, honor the reading of God's word. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcision by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new person out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, that's our memory verse for today, by the way, verse 19. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Father, this is your word. Speak to us through your word, your holy word your inspired word. And may we go out of this sanctuary this morning with the sense that we are different, we are included, and we are in Christ because of your coming and dying on the cross for us. We bless you for this opportunity in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Christ the chief cornerstone. That's uh, the text that we're going to be looking at this morning from this passage of scripture. And I want to suggest to you that there are uh, three very important words that are mentioned in this passage of scripture. And this will form sort of the outline of my thoughts as I share with you this morning. Notice that in verse 11 he says, formerly you who are Gentiles, that is who, that's all of us here. That's who we were apart from Christ. But then in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, and then kind of the so what, if you will, of this passage of scripture, verse 19, consequently you are. Formerly you were excluded, but now in Christ you're included, consequently you are. And we're going to be looking at that from that perspective. Now, notice how Paul in this passage of scripture, as Pastor Mark has talked with us about Paul, just sort of just like, these words are just rolling, just he can hardly slow his pen down as he piles up these words. And he describes who we were apart from Christ. Dead, you were dead, you were separate, you were excluded, you were foreigners, you were without hope, and you were without God. I thought of when I was going to school at Gulliver in the UP that I, I was never selected to be the first on anybody's team especially when we were playing softball or baseball. The kids knew that I knew how to hunt, how to trap, how to fish, but they knew I was terrible at playing baseball. And so I would be the last to be chosen on anybody's team. And I felt excluded, I felt separated from, I felt like I was a foreigner, I was without hope. And I can sense a bit of that as I read what Paul is suggesting in this passage of scripture for these Gentiles who feel the same thing. They feel excluded and separated from God. And there is very little hope of them being included. St. Augustine, in his confessions, 
uh, wrote a st statement that is so true about how impossible it is to solve our own spiritual problems in our own selves. He says, the truth is that disordered lust springs from a perverted will. When lust is pandered to, a habit is formed, and when a habit is not checked, it hardens into compulsion. That's where we are apart from Jesus Christ. We're in this hardened lifestyle, there's no hope, there's no way of, 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 of getting through this whole situation without the presence of Christ. And so we notice that in this particular text. But he says, but now in Christ Jesus. And there's the significant change. You who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. And Paul makes much of it in this text again and again. It's he is our peace. He is the one. It's in Christ. It's through Christ. And, and, and it's in him that we are being built. So that we, we find that the cross is the, the significant difference. And then comes the consequently you are. No longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Now, this dividing wall of hostility, I want us to think about that for just a few moments. Peace is the descriptive word in God's household. And here is, again and again, Paul repeats this theme in this text that we read to you. Verse 14, he himself is our peace. Verse 15, thus making peace. Verse 16, putting to death their hostility. Verse 17, Jesus came and preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who were near. Here is the, the, the whole crux of the matter in the body of Christ is the fact that we are persons who are at peace, but we're living in a world that is not at peace. There are all these walls that separate and divide, and there is this hostility that is so present in our culture, and we see it politically, we see it theologically, we see it socially, we see it economically. I mean, this, we're, we're living in a world that is just full of all these walls of hostility. I remember when uh, President Reagan said to uh, Mr. Gorbachev, uh, Mr. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall when he was talking about the Berlin Wall. And I've thought of the various walls that, I mean, we have a, a wall now that is separating us from our, our, our people from the south in Mexico, this, this, this wall that is hopefully uh, uh, something that is not going to divide and, and, and destroy who we are in America. But we are familiar with walls and denominational walls and... Uh, I, I recall when I was a pastor here many years ago, I, I organized a group of pastors to go to the Peach Dome down in Georgia. And we went to a clergy conference where I think there were 40 or 50,000 pastors gathered. And uh, it was just exciting for me to see all these pastors coming together. There were biker pastors, there were Messianic Jews who were there, there were Catholics, there were Protestants, there were Baptists, there were in fact, my prayer partner was an Episcopalian priest. And, and it was just interesting to see all of the different people that came together. And in Christ, we were at peace. In Christ, we experienced a wonderful and marvelous unity. And that's what Paul is preaching about in this passage of Scripture. I can remember one of the leaders at, at that conference in, in Atlanta said, I'd like for all of you to shout out when I give you the word on account of one to three, uh, the name of your denomination. And so we all, one, two, three, and we all s said what our denomination was. I hollered out free Methodist, but I don't think anybody heard me because there was just this great crescendo of confusion about all these different denominations and all these different groups. And then he said, I want you to, say, to, to in unison, say the word of the one who has saved you from sin, Jesus Christ. And there was wonderful unison as everybody in the room just said, Jesus Christ. And it was just beautiful for me to behold that wonderful sense of unity that we had as we thought of, of the peace of Jesus Christ. But we're living in a world that is full of all these walls of hostility. There may be hostility in your home, in your marriage, in your relationship with somebody at work. There may be, uh, I, I just don't know what those walls are. There, there are certainly Calvinist walls and Wesleyan walls and, and, and it's just, just a part of our culture uh, democratic walls, uh, Republican walls, all kinds of political barriers and so on. But it's interesting that in Christ, what Paul is saying here is that in Christ, he comes and preaches peace 
to those who are hostile toward one another. And in Christ, these walls come down. Praise the Lord for that. And that's what Paul is emphasizing in this passage of Scripture. So he came and he preached peace. And I want you to notice that, as someone has said, fear is opposed to peace. Uh, fear is false evidence appearing real, someone has suggested, or fake news. And if we're caught up in, in fear, we are, we, are, we are not going to have any peace in our hearts, but Christ comes to bring peace. In fact, remember in John 14, just before Jesus went back to his Father in heaven, and before he went to the cross, his disciples are troubled, and they're very anxious, and they are afraid. And Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And then he said, peace I leave with you, not as the world gives I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, and do not be afraid. Whenever Christ invades your home as a husband and wife, whenever Christ invades your work relationships, whenever Christ invades any of our interpersonal relationships, he brings peace. And that's the beautiful thing about the cross that Paul is emphasizing in this passage of Scripture. Then he makes this note that I think is important for us to understand, that he abolished in his flesh the rites of purification as far as ceremonial law, how sacrifices are to be offered because he was the one supreme sacrifice. No more sacrifices are needed. Now the ethical law stays. The Ten Commandments are still there in terms of God's ethical expectations. But he talks about abolishing in his flesh the law, these restrictors that keep, keep people from experiencing the true cleansing power of Jesus Christ. And then I like verse 15 when he says, he wanted to create in himself one new person out of the two, thus making peace. And it's interesting the Greek word that Paul uses here, because in the Greek language, there are two dominant words that can be used for the word new. Uh, neos is new at some point in time. For instance, uh, I go across the street and I get myself a, a, a Big Mac. Uh, now, it's, it's, it's a new Big Mac. It hasn't it, it's, it's fresh and, and all of that, but I, there are perhaps one billion or more others that have been created, and it, so it's not a unique kind of experience. Or I go to purchase a new F-250, which I would love to do, and, and every pastor ought to have one, and it's desperately needed, as you might understand. But that F-250 is, is simply, it, 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 it's a new, new truck, but there have been thousands of others that have been built just like it. And so that's one, one word that can be used for new. But the word that Paul uses here, kainos, is that it's new in the sense that it has never existed before. It is something that is brand new. To create in himself one new person out of the two, thus making peace. So the, the distinction between Gentile and Jew, between male and female, between all these, all these distinctions that are often made in our culture, those are all gone when Christ comes with a message of peace and creating one new person out of the two. Now, I not want you to notice how many times Paul uses the word one in the text. Verse 14, he has made the two one. Verse 15, to creating himself one new person out of the two. Verse 16, in this one body to reconcile both of them to God. Verse 18, we, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So here it is that, that uh, there, there's a new sense of unity. Now, you could tie two cats together by their tails, and you could have unity, but not peace. <laughs> and uh, I don't suggest that you do that, but what Paul is, is suggesting here is that there is a new sense of unity that happens when Christ comes into our hearts and into our lives and dissolve, dissolves our destructive differences. He ends the hostility, and out of the one makes you. This is the thing that I think is very important for us as a church at this particular time, as we're going through this transitional time, and we don't know who the new pastor is going to be, and we're a little unsure about maybe a lot of things, and there's a sense of anxiety that can take over. But I just want to encourage you to understand that we are one in Jesus Christ. And in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came and was poured out upon that early church, 
the one word that is appearing occasionally throughout the book of Acts is they were all together in one place and they were all with one accord. That is, it's not that they didn't have personal distinctions and differences, but about the big thing, about the mission of the church and what Christ wants to, to t- have take place, they're, they're agreed. And, and we can have our differences here and still get along with each other. And I mean, I know that some people talk about, uh, oh, I don't like the fact that we're going to have one service during July, or I, I'm not all that into contemporary music, or I'm not all that into hymns, or I'm uh, different styles and different things that can, can become divisive things are really insignificant in the, in the light of what Christ wants to do in bringing us together as one congregation with one purpose, with one desire and one heart, that we are one together and united together in Jesus Christ. Then I want you to notice another thing in this text, is that verse 18, he says, for through him, that is through Christ, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Now I want you to think of that, access. You have access where you have been previously denied access, but you are now included We have access to the Father by one spirit, any time, any place, any person. I mean, this is absolutely astonishing to think that it doesn't make any difference, educated, uneducated, how old or how young, or any of the other distinctions that may be societal in nature or cultural in nature, that you have the same access to God that that the Pope has. You have the same access to God that somebody who may be one of the most devoted persons you know has. What a wonderful gift that is. I hope, you, I hope you rejoice in that. I hope you understand that, that we have access to God, previously excluded, previously on the outside, but now included because of what Christ did on the cross. And then it's interesting to me, and I'm just continuing with the text here just a bit longer. Notice that Paul uses... Uh, what, our architectural terms when he says that we are being built as a building. So he uses the word God's household, built on the foundation, chief cornerstone, the whole building, joined together, holy temple, being built, become a dwelling. And he's talking about the fact that Christ is building his church and that you and I are are part of this grand temple or sanctuary that he is building to make an impact in our world. And, And how beautiful is that thought to to, to me as I, as I rejoice in the fact that I'm a part of his building. Now I want you to notice something else in this text. That he talks about that we are being built. It's not that I have arrived. Okay, here I am, uh, an old man. Have I arrived? No, I'm still growing in the Lord. I'm still being built. What about you? Regardless of your chronology spiritually or how long it's been that you've been a Christian, We are all in process. We are growing. We are being built. And soul craft is about that. It's about process. We haven't arrived. If anybody gives the impression that, "Mm, look at me. I mean, if you just be as spiritual as I am, uh, wouldn't this church be a wonderful place to be? Well, we're, we're all growing. We are all being built. It's done in community. And as John Wesley emphasized, it's social religion. It's, it's personal, but it's not private. That is, my, my concern for you and your concern for me should be mutually edifying and encouraging because we're growing together in community and in Christ. Now, the heart of my message is, is, uh, is on this next point that I want to ma- mention. I'm getting behind here. I get busy and then I forget what I'm talking about. I want to talk to you about my journey. And... Uh, Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. With Jesus as the chief cornerstone. And I want to just just personalize this in terms of my own spiritual journey just a bit that maybe can be helpful to you. I went to Asbury Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. I got my Master of Divinity there. I got my Doctor of Ministry there. And uh, I I had a wonderful experience at Asbury. after I was at Asbury Seminary, after I finished my MDiv, I was appointed to a little church in uh, northwest Indiana called Attica, near Lafayette. And uh, Marge and I were, were, we were young, we had, we had no idea. When we went to that first church after seminary, we didn't know where the church was. I had never been to Attica, Indiana. 
I didn't know until just a few hours before the appointment was read by the bishop that that's where I would be assigned. I didn't know anybody there. I had never been there. And, and so we loaded up our, all of our earthly belongings in a truck that said, Adventure in Moving, U-Haul. And she drove the little Volkswagen Beetle that we had for our transportation, and I drove this truck, and we headed from Lexington, Kentucky, to Attica, Indiana. Now, this was an interesting experience, <laughs> because uh, I had never been to Attica before, and when we got there, the parsonage was an absolute mess. The front porch was rotted out. We had to lay boards down to move our furniture in. Bees had built a colony of honeybees were in the wall inside the kitchen. Uh, the master bedroom was something that is to behold. Ceiling paper was hanging down because there's a leak in the master bedroom. And uh, when Marge got inside, she broke down and cried. And I fe felt like it, but I, I, I think I, I made it without. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we went over to the church and we learned that the church had been built in 1874 and Bishop E.P. Hart, for whom Hart Auditorium is named, was the bishop who presided over the building of the Wabash Conference in 1874 and that, that building had been constructed then. They had a large bolt, or three or four bolts through this building. Was, the outside walls were brick and it was held together by these turnbuckles that kept the, the walls from collapsing. And behind me, where I would preach, were funeral curtains. The interesting thing was that a funeral director donated those funeral curtains to the church because the plaster was falling down behind the pulpit area and they wanted to kind of disguise things. And so they, they decided that would be a good thing to do. And uh, these funeral curtains were what they used to use. Some of you may not be even familiar with this, but years ago, many years ago, they would, have, they would do the viewing of a of, somebody would die, they would have the viewing of the body in the home, in the parlor or wherever it might be, and these curtains were what they used. So every Sunday morning I'm preaching life and people look behind me and they see evidence of death. <laughs> it's just quite an encouraging thing. Uh, and, and I remember uh, one Sunday that we, the, the, the basement used to flood. And I didn't know that it was my pastoral responsibility to clean the basement up after it flooded, but I found out it was. And uh, I remember one Sunday, one of the ladies had gone down to teach her Sunday school class, and when she came back up out of the, the basement after teaching class, she said, I want you to look at my legs. Well, as a pastor, I tried not to focus on women's legs, but <laughs> anyway, that morning I looked, and her, her nylons were covered with fleas. And uh, Marge later reminded me that she didn't feel God had called us to pastor the Flea Methodist Church. But anyway... We had fleas. Then add to that that when we arrived there, the man who had been the Sunday school superintendent had turned his back on the Lord and was downtown tending bar at Sandy's Tavern. His wife was having an affair with the guy who had been in charge of the uh, intermediate Sunday school class. And I mean, it was, just, it was just very discouraging. And I got very depressed. And I, 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 I just began to think now, Lord, I'm a very talented person. Why did they send me to a place like this? You know, I mean, and I, uh, I was very discouraged and I thought about following the advice of some of my seminary prof professors who had encouraged me with the possibility of going to Princeton to, to school and, and getting a doctorate and coming back and teaching at Asbury Seminary. And I began to feel a pull in that direction thinking, well, maybe I've made the wrong choice. Maybe I should have gone on to Princeton. And I started developing in me a sense of hostility toward the conference, toward the Lord, toward the church, and, and, and began to wonder if this is where I should be. And uh, uh, there, there are many other features that, that, that were a part of that whole process, but I, I just different times thought about calling the conference superintendent and said, I've had all this church that I want, I can't take any more of it, I'm, I'm out of here. And one day Marge asked me if I would go down to the local A&P store downtown to get some bread and some milk. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember the A&P stores, but anyway. Uh, I went down to the A&P store and I'm processing all this, this hurt and this 
hostility that I'm feeling. In addition to that, I had one member on our church board that had the spiritual gift of being in opposition to everything I planned to do. I mean, anything that I was for, he was against. And, and it was just, just, just those kinds of things going on in my mind. So I go down to the AMP store and I'm processing all of these anxious thoughts and, and, and some of the anger and hostility I was feeling. And, and I walk into the store and, and something happened. I heard somebody whistling. And, and it was uh, the guy who was the meat cutter. He was getting ready, putting the meat in the meat case for the day. And he was behind the meat case with his white apron on and all. And, and he was whistling. And what he was whistling was Stuart Hamlin's song, It Is No Secret What God Can Do. And do you know what the Holy Spirit had the audacity to do? The Holy Spirit had the audacity to tell me the problem isn't with the fleas. The problem isn't with the bolts in the church. The problem isn't with the funeral curtains. The problem isn't with the man who's downtown tending bar. The problem isn't with the member of the board that's always against whatever you want. That's not the problem. The problem is with you. I gulped, and I thought, yes, Lord. And I want to tell you, I don't know if you've ever been arrested by God in an A&P store, or if the Holy Spirit in some of the most common, ordinary places has taken some common, ordinary person and spoken to you. But Delbert Cobble, who was the meat cutter, later I got to know him and he became a, a member of our church. But God used him, whistling a Stuart Hamlin song as he was arranging the meat in the meat case. And God used him to speak to the heart of this young pastor. And I want to tell you that God did something in my heart then. And something happened that changed my ministry. And something happened that directed me in a very new direction. And I'd have to say it was a turning point in my pastoral ministry. We began to see people say, oh, the fleas were still there. And the old boats were still and the funeral curtains were still there. But God began to work in my heart and my life and in that church. And we saw a turnaround. We, we were able eventually to build a new church. And we saw the Spirit of God moving. And, and what looked like it was going to be a, the worst experience of my pastoral ministry became one of the best experiences of my pastoral ministry. And I would have to say that in addition to, to being pastor here for 14 years, that the years I spent at Attica, Indiana, were some of the best years I ever had. Because God came... And with these walls of hostility that have been building in my heart and in my mind, God came and brought peace. And you know he can do that for you. God's a specialist at doing that sort of thing. I don't know most of you here, but God knows you. He knows your home. He knows the situation you're involved in. He knows the challenges that are before you in your work situation. He knows all those sorts of things. And I know that the thing he longs for every one of us is he wants to come and preach peace to us. He wants to come and break down the walls of hostility between husband and wife, parent and child, next door neighbor, employer, employee. He wants to bring peace. And Jesus is the only one who can do that. And I pray this morning that you will allow him to do that in your heart, should it be, if those barriers are there, that Christ will come and speak his peace he comes and preaches peace at Paul. And I'm so glad for that.